Hi everyone and welcome to this tutorial on RSPT calculations. In this video I will show you how to perform calculations of interatomic exchange parameters JIJs. But before we start, let me go for the theory. When we model magnetic materials, we are often interested in their excitation properties, in their dynamics and ordinal temperature. The easiest way to do it is to map a system on the Heisenberg model. So what is a Heisenberg model? It's a model of interacting localized spins. It assumes that the electrons around each magnetic atom are producing a localized magnetic moment. And then these moments are interacting via so-called exchange interaction JIJ. In real material, the interactions can be quite long ranged, so you can have couplings between nearest neighbors, next nearest neighbors, etc. So this is how the model is written. We have a sum over all possible bonds. We have a scalar product between the vectors representing our spins. These vectors are normalized to unity. And in front of the scalar product, we have a coupling constant Jij. So depending on the sign of a Jij, the spins are coupled either ferromagnetically, if the Jij is positive, or antiferromagnetically, if the Jij is negative. So in practice, we can access finite temperature and excited state properties of magnets by using the so-called two-step approach. In the first step, we perform the DFT calculation and extract the JIJ parameters from first principles. And then, once we have a parameterized Heisenberg model, we can solve it, either treating spins as classical vectors or to treat them as quantum operators. But the good thing is that we can solve such kind of models by using Monte Carlo calculations, and this gives access to the ground state magnetic order and also the ordering temperature. The excitations in Heisenberg magnets look like this. They form spin waves. These excitations are dispersive, and the dispersion can be calculated either by using atomistic spin dynamics or directly calculating adiabatic magnon spectrum, which in practice is just diagonalization of Fourier transform of JIJ matrix. So the key question is how to obtain these JIJs from first principles. And in general, there are two commonly used methods. We can use the DFT total energies and calculate the total energies of different magnetic orders, for example, ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic. And by calculating the differences between these energies, we can map those onto the Heisenberg model and deduce the coupling constant strength. An alternative approach is to use the magnetic force theory. And in a way, it's like a linear response theory. So what we do, instead of flipping the spins completely, we do small rotation of them, like so. And we do it in a linear response fashion, so these rotations are in fact infinitesimal. In practice, we just have to calculate this kind of integral, which I explain to you in a minute. So how does it work? Basically, we start from certain reference state. In this case, we consider ferromagnetic order. We pick up two spins and we slightly perturb them. And the key procedure here is the mapping. So we perform this perturbation on a level of classical Heisenberg model. This is quite trivial. We have some initial spin directions and then we add a little perturbation. We expand the rotation up to the second order. So we expand to Hamiltonian, collecting all these terms. And it's quite easy to show that in the second order, we will have expression which looks like this. We have a JIJ times the absolute value of this difference between the two rotation angles. And now what we have to do is to perform the same perturbation, but on a level of electronic Hamiltonian or any kind of tight binding Hamiltonian. So we apply the same perturbation. It means that we apply transformation matrix U, which rotates our spin. And again, we expand it up to the second order in rotation angles. And after a bit of algebra, what you end up with is the following expression. It looks very reminiscent of what we got for classical Heisenberg model. We get some integral in front of the same construction. So it means that the expression in front of it can be mapped onto the JIJ. And basically it consists of two terms. We have a local exchange splitting, which is defined as the difference between the projected Hamiltonian up minus local projected Hamiltonian down Plus, we have a contribution from the self-energy, because as it was shown in the second paper, the approach also holds as long as the self-energy is local. 
It can be dynamical, like in the case of LDA plus D with T, or it can be static, as in the case of LDA plus U. You can calculate the center of gravity of spin up and spin down states, and the difference will roughly correspond to the average local exchange splitting. And the second ingredient is the interset Green's function, which is constructed from the Hamiltonian and the soft energy, and it describes the propagation from site J to I. How does it work in practice? We select certain site. As you saw, the expression operates with local exchange splitting and interset Green's function, which in fact can be calculated between any atoms in the material. So from a single calculation, we can access the interaction between this site and its nearest neighbor here, this one, and also the coupling to this neighbor and this one. But fortunately, most often we have some symmetries in the material. So for example, the interaction between the nearest neighbors is the same, so we don't have to calculate the couplings with every individual neighbor, and it's enough just to calculate with one of them. Well, how we define what is belonging to site I and site J. The spins are formed by electrons around these atoms, but they are only defined approximately. So the typical approach is to assign all the electrons belonging to this Moffentine sphere to corresponding atom. But this is only one choice. In principle, we can also take the original basis and orthonormalize it, and we will end up with another set of orbitals, which will also be orthogonal on different sites. But now, we will have quite different spatial form. So in RSPT we commonly use these two projections, and as you can imagine, since the projections are different, the results can also be a little different. In general, your JIJs will unavoidably depend on the choice of this projection. However, quite often you get quite similar results with both projections. So here is an example of FCC nickel taken from one of our papers, and as you can see, both projections give quite consistent results. If you were to calculate the ordering temperature, you might see a little differences. So before you start the calculation, here is a little memo. First of all, when we calculate the JIJs, we have to make sure that the calculation is converge. For example, with respect to the number of K points and other parameters. So I typically try to converge FSQ down to 10 to minus 11. The good rule of thumbs is that the magnetic moments should be converged up to 10 to minus 3 Bohr magnitude. This is usually sufficient to get well-converged JIJs. We will also have to use Fermi smearing, and it is so because we are using DMFT machinery, and we will calculate the exchange integrals by, integ by doing integrations on Matsubara axis. Therefore, we have to set some effective temperature. And a good choice here is 400 Kelvin, which corresponds to 2.5 millirudber. Number of Matsubara frequencies, of course, will depend on the temperature. 1200 is a good number for this temperature, but we don't need to calculate all of them. We can use interpolation scheme, and in practice, we calculate maybe only 100 of them. And finally, we will have to prepare one more K-mesh file, which will span the entire brilliant zone. So this is important before we can so this is important and we will not be able to calculate JIJs before we do this. And it is so because when we calculate the interset Green's function, we create certain bond in a certain direction, and having this bond locally breaks the symmetries of the crystal. And because of the symmetry breaking, we cannot calculate only irreducible wedge of the brilliant zone. We have to perform calculation for each K point separately. So in practice, we do it in the following way. We have to create a new simco file containing only one symmetry operation, which is just identity. And we have to generate the K point mesh with a cube program using this new simco file, which I name lowsim in this case. So this way, the k-point mesh will be generated without applying any symmetry operations. To calculate the JIJs, we have to create the green.inc file, and it has to contain several entries. Well, first of all, we need to set up the Matsubara mesh. So this will be used to integrate the JIJ expression. This is a reasonable choice for the default temperature. And as you can see, we only calculate first 60 Matsubara points. And in the rest of 1200 Matsubaras, we only calculate 60 of them 
and the rest will be interpolated. Input output block is set to false if you don't have any self energy. Otherwise, the first flag has to be changed to true. And now we come to the most important block, which is called ISO exch. So first we define the projection, which will define the way we will construct the states representing site I and site J. And here we have two choices. Choice number one will use the same projection as Brianna uses. And Brianna uses projection one by default, which is Muffington heads. For JIJs, we can also have another choice, which is called generalized ORT. And what it does, it basically does the Lofdin orthogonalization of the entire LMTO basis. And we can only use this projection for the JIJs, but not for the MFT part, because when we calculate the JIJs, there is no requirement to have a single L representation of our orbitals. We can use several tails, meaning that there are a bunch of states having the same angular momentum, but they're all meant to represent the D states. When we run the MFT, we have to have a single set of orbitals with a given L. After that, we basically specify the central atom. So this is the site which we will calculate the exchange interactions with. And then we can give a list of neighbors in this table. In the list of neighbors, you specify the site index of the neighbor and the translation vector, which has to be applied to it. So 0, 0, 0 represents untranslated atom. And finally, in this cluster block, we specify which states exactly are taken into account. So in this case, we have two atoms and we only pick up their D states. So here L is equal to 2. Keep in mind that site index which you specify here is the global index of the atom as it appears in the data file, while here you have to see what type it belongs to. Alternatively, we can also generate the list of neighbors automatically. To enable this, we have to modify just a few lines here. So after specifying the atom, which is going to be a central one, we specify the radius where we're going to look for neighbors. And here we specify how many magnetic atoms there are and their indices. So this way, the program will search for all the neighbors having these atomic indices in a given radius. And the radius is given in the units of length scale. I will include a useful script which I created called init JIJs. It produces a preliminary setup with some default values of Matsubara frequencies and the default radius of a cluster to search for neighbors. The script is not aware of whether you have a self energy or not in the calculation. All it does it opens the out underscore last file, which contains the summary of the last RSPT self consistent iteration. And it looks for the atoms which have a magnetic moment larger than 0.5 Bohr magneton. So this was my choice, because typically if the atoms have smaller magnetic moments, it's quite likely that the magnetic moment is just induced. And therefore the Heisenberg model becomes a bit questionable for it, because we assume that the spins are localized and well-defined. 